Welcome to the Dr. Carniel Show. This episode is all about eating well and feeling happy. So stay tuned. What could be better than eating well and being happy? It's a win-win for all of us. Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Carniel. I'm here with my co-host, Tara Kelly. Today on our show, we will have Liz Calibro, trainer and nutritionist, and Dr. Richard Podell, an expert on nutrition and supplements. Later on, we will also have a cooking demonstration by my good friend and health advocate, Lisa Allen. To begin, Liz, can you come on, show us how we can start our day? Hey, Tara. exercises that'll get us feeling good. Sure, love it. My favorite <laughs> part of the day is right. my exercise. Okay. How are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? Great. So we're gonna start off with a little bit of a warm up. So I like to do dynamic warm ups. Basically, okay. it's uh, movements to increase your mobility and get your heart rate up a little bit. Okay. So the first one that we're gonna do is a lunge. So the way we're gonna lunge, we're gonna come out and you're gonna come down, pushing through the hip. You wanna push your hips forward to open up the groin. This is very important because as we're sitting, the groin gets shaped like a banana. So we want to turn it the opposite way. So we're going to do a deep lunge and power off of the front foot, switch sides and power off. Would Wanna you like to demo? Let All me right. see. All right, let's see how I can do with this. Great. So you're opening up the groin. Oh, that feels good. Good. Pushing off the heel from the front leg to activate the glute. Nice job. Thank you. How are you feeling? I feel good. Good. All right. Next one we're going to do is called a walkout. So okay. the purpose of this, open up the hamstrings, which can also be tight on a lot of people from sitting, yeah. and activate the core. Okay. So you start standing up, then you're gonna tiptoe your hands out till you get to a plank, and then tiptoe back and stand up. All right, let's see what you got. It's an inchworm? Too? Yep, yep. Okay. So you're gonna inch out, activate your core, open up your hamstrings as you inch back. back. Perfect. Feel a little stretch? I did. Great, I love it. Yeah, me too. All right, last one is for more upper body mobility. Okay. So we're just gonna open up the shoulders, yeah, very simple. Tight. Sleep like this. Yes, many know. people. This is great to do in the morning, okay. as a, a lot of times we do sleep like this, or if you're sitting and typing, mm -hmm. you wanna open up your chest and shoulders. I'm just nervous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna make you <laughs> unnervous. You ready? <laughs> All right, so hands, you go up, palms facing forward, and then turn your palms away from your head, and then come back around. Yep, so hands straight up, palms face the walls, and then nice big circles. So this, you're just moving while you're doing it. So gradually, you're opening up the chest and shoulders. More relaxed already. That's great, I love it. Good. So you would do those three, maybe about a minute on each, just to open up that area. Now your mobility is better, your heart rate's up. Getting a little looser. That's great. A little more relaxed. Yes. And then we can start our workout part. Okay. You feeling ready? I'm ready. All right, cool. Ready. So the first thing we're gonna do for our workout is a push-up. Okay. So there's multiple ways to do a push-up. Okay. Uh, first, I would recommend making sure that you can use your core and your upper body can handle it. So if you wanna start on your knees, mm -hmm. you can push up this way. Now, as you get stronger, you don't have to do assisted. You can come up to your feet. I just don't wanna see butts in the air, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. All right, all right. So let's see what you got. Let me see, let me see what I can give you here. <laughs> all right. How's this now? I'm go like this. Yep, nice Tara, Thank look you. at you. I mean, you know. <laughs> Perfect, all right, love it. So you could do three sets of 15 reps, take about a 30 second break in between, use your chest, arms, a little bit of core. Okay. Cool, got it? All right, I got it. All right, good. Next one I like to do is called the Superman. It's very simple. All of these are body weight exercises. This helps to strengthen the low back and the glutes. So you would just lay down on a mat or on the floor, lift hands and legs, squeeze, relax, lift and squeeze. That's good for your butt. Everybody yep. likes a good butt. Yeah, right? you know it. That's good, all right. So, <laughs> yep, squeeze and then relax. Good, so you're using your glutes, your low back. This is the opposite of a crunch. So don't forget about the low back when you're trying to strengthen your core. Oh, good. good. So it's like a little imaginary bell around our stomach. Yeah. All right, awesome. Next one we're gonna do is called shoulder taps. 
come into a plank position and then you're gonna take one arm at a time, tap the shoulders. The goal here is to stay stable. Is your core strong enough to handle when you remove one of your hands? So a lot of people will be doing this. So if you're one of those, come to the knees okay. and make sure your form is good before you transition to a full plank. Nice, so you're staying nice and stable. Hips are not rocking too much, great. Feel your core activating? Sure do. All the way around, good. If your low back was bothering you, you could always lift your hips a little higher because some people have a tendency to sink mm -hmm. into it because you're not activating your core all the way. Okay. But you felt it though? I felt it. Looks great. Thank you. All right, last one we're gonna Thanks. do is a little lower body. Okay. So first option, if you want to, you could use a step and you could do a step up. Okay. So simple to do at your house, but if you don't have steps, we're just going to do a squat. So you're just going to go ahead and squat as if you're sitting in a seat. So many people do this incorrectly where their knees go in together, they're leaning forward because their hips are too tight. So we want to make sure that you're getting back, sitting, activating your glutes, and pushing through your heels. And your back is nice and tight, your core is engaged, and you're using your legs. All right, let's see what you got. Great. So Tara's pushing through her heels, using mostly the glutes. Hips are nice and loose, so she's not leaning forward too much. She's able to sit back. Looks great. Oh, thanks. Nice job. Thank you. Cool, so a little total body, work in the upper body, lower body, core, mobility. Thanks. Getting your heart rate up. That was great. Good. I feel great. You can do this at home? I absolutely. All right, good. Awesome. And when we get back, it's time to talk food. Well, Thomas, you've got prediabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Hello. Hi. I'm from Blue Hood Stone Barns. We brought a meal for you and I'm here to serve it to you. Okay, great. Come in. Zucchini carbonara, made from zucchini that was harvested earlier this morning. Again? Oh, okay. Hey, Dan Barber. You have room for a little bit more? Come yeah, on come in. in. Brochettes, the sausage. So when we made that zucchini carbonara, you know, they're the end pieces of the zucchini, and they're the cores that we cut away, not to mention zucchini flour. Usually those get thrown out. We use them to create an entire second dish. Does that, oh. Again? Uh. I'm here to bring you your third course. It's the vines from your zucchini. We'll have a little zucchini stem pasta. A different experience of zucchini. When we start to think differently about our food, we can get a lot more out of it. This is delicious. What do you think we can make out of this? 40% of food in America is never eaten. Cook it, store it, share it. Visit savethefood.com. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. You can do it here. But you probably won't. You're busy. Kids, work, show coming back in 48 seconds. So let's do this now. Hold up one finger if you're a man, women, zero. Three more fingers if you're over 60, two over 50, one over 40. If you're not sure, keep in mind you're sitting on a couch right now. So one more finger if you're not very active. One finger if yes, zero if no. One yes, zero no. Next. Find the body type that looks most like you and hold up that many fingers while I look around awkwardly. And that's it. If you're holding up five fingers or more, you probably have prediabetes. Sorry to be so blunt, but hey, you're busy. Just go to the site. Welcome back. Now, let's ask our experts how and what we should eat that will make us feel happy. We, fortunately, this morning, we have Dr. Richard Podell, who has joined us. And I'm Dr. happy. Podell, welcome. Yes. And he's happy. All yes. right. So the question is really, what, what should people be eating? Well, they should be eating what's good for them and what they like. Now, how to put that concrete, that's a little harder. So 
So I know you love to eat blueberries, right? Absolutely. Right. Because you enjoy them. likes them also. Now, there are good things that are good for you that people eat and they enjoy. There's a whole bunch of things that are not so good for us, which people eat a little bit and it's okay, and they eat more and more and they feel better and better, and then they crash. And things like sugar and most processed foods fall into that. But we're not here to say negative things, right? We're going to talk about what's good. And that's going to vary by each individual because what people like, and in general, we need to pick from the natural foods, what people like are going to individually differ from person to person. Okay, now you mentioned natural food. So we're talking about just food you buy, or we're talking about organic food, about GMO food. What kind of food are we okay. talking about? Well, this is a very controversial area. Um, That's why we're discussing it. I think it. if you can afford organic, it's probably better for you because there's a whole lot of sort of toxic things that are put in there to kill bugs that feed on plants. On the other hand, most people can't really afford organic, even though the organic foods tend to taste better. And so there what you want is fruits and vegetables, lean meat, fish, chicken. And if you can do that and find the things within that that you really enjoy, you're going to be healthier and therefore you're going to be happier. Now, when you hear about meat, you hear about all the antibiotics they feed the animals, the chemicals they feed the, feed the animals to make them grow more. So it, it gets to a lot of issues. What, what's the story on that? Well, the story is that I don't think we're really sure. There's a lot of political prejudice. You know, a lot of, you know, like China doesn't let us uh, export beef there because we're not clean enough. Now, is that for real because we're really going to harm the Chinese? Probably not. That's political. Uh, I think what I do for myself and for people who can afford it is to do the proper grass-fed, the humane, and all this kind of stuff. But I don't think we really have strong evidence of the major harm. It's, it's harm due to antibiotics because it's going to spread antibiotic resistance. But the idea that you will eat some and it will damage you may be so, but it's not really proved. And so I think from, from my perspective, we really don't know. So what is grass-fed beef? I mean, don't, doesn't all beef eat grass? I think a cow well, is a thing if, of meeting grass. Well, if you let them. But if you put your, your beef, your cows, or your chickens in a barn, and you're going to feed them some sort of cornmeal or whatever it's going to be, and they're not going to let them walk around, you're not going to have real healthy animals. And so part of the feeling is that the animals that are fed their more natural food and that are fed more organic food and that are, you know, just treated better, that they're going to be healthier and that they're going to taste better. Now, I personally, I think they do taste better. But now, uh, Liz, what do you think about this? You're a nutritionist. Yeah, so I definitely choose grass-fed beef personally for myself also. Um, it's actually a higher omega-3 content than more conventional beef because they have a better fat quality to them. So from there, it is a lower inflammatory choice of beef than conventional beef. Um, I also choose organic chicken uh, more for the antibiotic reason. It is true that a lot of people do develop over, their year, over the years they live antibiotic resistant bacteria that they end up getting because they're taking in a lot of antibiotics from regular chicken and regular beef without realizing it. So even though they're not taking antibiotics for being sick, they're taking the antibiotics in from the food. So that would be my thing on me. And then vegetables, my favorite is to look at the Dirty Dozen list every year. Have you heard of the Dirty Dozen list? No, tell us about the Dirty Dozen. Sure. So the Dirty Dozen is the 12 dirtiest fruits and vegetables for that year. So those would be the fruits and vegetables that you would want to choose organic. So if budget is definitely a concern, don't buy everything organic. Educate yourself. Look at the Dirty Dozen list, strive to buy organic of those, and then you can buy regular so other they, fruits and vegetables. So does that change every year? Is the same Dirty Dozen, they change them? It changes a little bit every year. I mean, what Tip grower wants to have dirty food? I know. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Typical foods you would see on there would be foods that would soak up a lot of the water because some of the pesticides um, are getting into the fruit that way. So a lot of your, you know, lettuces, celery, spinach, uh, berries can be on there, as opposed to like a banana or an avocado that has a very hard outside. Yeah. Now, I, I want to disagree a little bit on, on, <laughs> on one point here. Uh, you know, I have 
practice with chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia patients, about half of whom are on disability. They have very little money. And so here we're living in, you know, some of New Jersey areas, very affluent. I think that we should also be clear to the people who don't have a lot to afford that if they can't have organic food, there's still ways to eat healthy mm -hmm. with the regular old food. So that's my disagreement. Yes. Okay, so besides healthy, what foods are going to make them happier? So what kind of diet is going to make you happier? And what's going to sort of jam your body up and make you less happy long term? Well, sugar and saturated fat will do both. They will get you happier in the short run and get you sicker in the long run and in the medium run. Maybe you can tell us more about that. <laughs> oh, that's all there is to say. <laughs> well, uh, I, I would say yeah. definitely sugar helps your body to release serotonin, which is your happy-go-lucky hormone or neurotransmitter. So now you feel good, you got a little sugar in you, but then, of course, everything in moderation. You want to have a little piece of dark chocolate as a treat. Once you go to be a little too much and you have too much sugar in your diet, that's what actually is going to start to inflame you and cause certain diseases and make you less happy. Now, but we keep dark chocolate in the office for all the patients because it has less sugar, mm -hmm. has antioxidants, and makes you feel good. Uh, so are they allowed to eat the dark chocolate? I mean, in our a, office they do. You have a piece or two of it. It's, Paul, in, moder you, it's yeah. in moderation, and I feel like... For me, I have, you know, after I have lunch every day, I have, I have a Dove dark chocolate, and that for me is kind of, gives me a little sweet, gives me a little up, and then, you know, and then you maybe don't crave so much later in the day, but you have to be mindful of it, too. You have to, you, you know, your own, your own ways, your own cravings and such. If you're going to eat dark chocolate and then it's going to cause you to eat the whole bag, you probably should yeah. stay away from it. Yeah. There was an important experiment done with feeding people sugar in a disguised liquid. Uh, and what they found is that the people who tend to put on weight, if you, before the meal, you pre-feed them with some sugary thing, uh, they're going to eat more. But regular old people who tend to be thin, like yourself, I expect, uh, you give them the sugar before the meal, they're going to eat less. That is, the sugar satisfied their need to eat, where there's a whole bunch of people where priming you with sugar makes you want to eat more. And so those people have to know who they are and adjust to that. You can eat probably one dark chocolate, I'll bet. See, see what I usually do, if we're going out, say, to a party or a big dinner, and I don't want to overeat the meal, before I go out, I'll either have some protein or some vegetables or some fruit. So I'm half full at least before I get there, so when I get there, I'm not ravenous, and then I can restrict my eating more. Whereas otherwise, if I get to dinner and I'm hungry, I'm going to eat the first thing that comes out, which is that big basket of bread. Okay. But you if want to I know a fun fact about the bread? So I always used to work in a restaurant, and then having my nutrition background, that's why I know this. They give you bread first to stimulate your appetite because you're feeding yourself with carbs first, which, like doctor said, most people will be hungrier yeah. later. When you eat the bread, you're more likely to order dessert. Yeah. That, that's a good point. That's a really good point. If I so, ate before the meal, I would eat more at the meal. And not you, if you had protein, would, it would, would slow no, you down. No, that wouldn't. That, it, that, that simply, there are two different groups of people there. And you He's have to know who you are. Of his own, of, of, his, of, of, of his, his body type. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what about an apple? Would an apple slow you down? Um, I never tried that. What, what do you think, Liz? Well, I always tell my clients, you know, just be mindful. But in general, if you do start your meal with a carb, you might be hungrier. And if you started it with a protein, you might be a little bit more satisfied because protein does help to stabilize your blood sugar. So maybe for an appetizer, can you order some, uh, you know, shrimp or a little bit of a, a salad, maybe with some cheese to get some healthy protein in, as mm. opposed to going right after the bread. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, that, that's very important. That was a great discussion about how to eat to be happy. And now over in the kitchen, we have Lisa Allen, who's going to a food demonstration on how to make a very good snack. Hi, I'm Lisa Allen, and today we're gonna to talk about foods that make you feel good. And I've got a recipe for you that's a twist on an old American favorite. It's the peanut butter and jelly smoothie. So I don't know about you, but it makes me a little nostalgic. And the best part is, it's a no fuss food. You're gonna be done with this in less than five minutes. So let's get started. Okay, I have very few ingredients, which is really good. 
and I'm not going to put, um, I'm not going to dirty any pans. I have one little blender here, which is my Vitamix, and we're going to start with peanut butter. Of course, it wouldn't be the same without peanut butter. You're going to notice I have one scoop of peanut butter. Now, you can do more than this, however, this has a lot of fat. It has a lot of protein, but it has a lot of fat. So if you're gonna watch your fat content, I would suggest just one scoop. The next is fresh strawberries. Now look at this, these are amazing. And you're gonna notice I did not cut the tops off. I'm a bit of a greenie, and so keeping this on gives you a little extra vitamins, but for those who don't want any green in their smoothie, please feel free to cut it off. So we're gonna throw that in. And then we're gonna use a little bit of chocolate protein powder, if you can see that. Now, protein is an essential building block for you, and I try to sneak in protein any time that I eat or drink. So I would say you could do a chocolate, because I'm a chocoholic, or you could do a plain protein, a vanilla protein, whatever you prefer, but definitely put a little protein in your smoothies. Okay, moving along, we're under five minutes still. The next one is a little bit of a secret. This is a frozen banana. Now, you may not be a banana fan, so you don't have to put this in there, but I like frozen bananas in almost anything, or even a frozen avocado. It adds smoothness, it's a little bit of sweetness, and it's a ton of potassium for you. And then, another ingredient is chia seeds. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with chia seeds, but it has a ton of omega and it has a lot of fiber. The average person should get about 28 grams of fiber a day. And what it does with the chia seeds is when it gets wet, it expands and you feel less hungry. So I try to put chia in most of my smoothies as well. And the final ingredient, and this is a little secret, you're gonna see it, it looks like milk, but I have a half a cup of water and a half a cup of milk. The milk is great for protein, but I cut it with the water because I feel like then I'm not getting as much fat. And that's it. We're ready to blend our peanut butter and jelly smoothie. This is super simple. Just put the lid on. And I have this little gadget, it's a tamper. So you put this in to really push down the food and it's gonna be loud for a few minutes, but then we're done. Here we go. We're gonna feel satiated and it's gonna be delicious. I promise you, for all those that grew up on peanut butter and jelly, this is for you. Bottoms up. That was fantastic. A quick way to make a delicious, healthy snack. Another big issue is the role of supplements. Should people be using supplements? Should you take them? What should you use? So I'll turn this over to all of my experts. All right, Tara, what do you think? Uh, I happen to use supplements um, mainly out of convenience, to be honest with you. I'm a mom, I have two kids, I have a job, as you know. So um, uh, protein powder and um, protein bars for me kind of are just something that I can grab and go and get some a good amount of protein in, get full, and be able to get, get whatever I need to get done. And Liz and Dr. Podell, what do you think about supplements? Well, uh, you know, the supplement industry is huge nowadays. Uh, they're getting more popular. Now it's a big money-making industry also. So if you notice now, there's so many companies out there and so many products, you're like, oh no, what do I take? What do I need? And is this good for my body? So something that actually the FDA is coming in and helping us, they are going and inspecting labs for cleanliness and for mm -hmm. what's on the label is actually inside the product. So if you're looking at a product and you don't know if it's good or not, uh, the ones that are approved by the FDA are called GMP certified, which stands for Good Manufa Manufacturing Processing. So those GMP certified supplements are a little bit of a higher quality, especially there's a lot of supplements that use proprietary blends in them, which is where on the outside it just says proprietary blend. Let's say it's a pre-workout, for example. One of the first ingredients could be caffeine, and you don't really know how much caffeine's in there, so it might be 400 milligrams. Four cups of coffee later, mm -hmm. you're running around. <laughs> what do you think? Well, let me tell you, I can't stand most vegetables. Right? So I have a shake in the morning where I put in the broccoli and the spinach. I also add protein because if it's all carbs, that's not real good. 
And for me, that works. Because you can't taste the vegetables that way. Can't right? taste the vegetables. <laughs> and I put in some fruit to balance it. I put in blueberries, actually, to balance mm -hmm. it. And so it's sweet enough, but it's not a real sugar high. And otherwise, I wouldn't be getting the green vegetables that I know I'm supposed to get. Other people love green vegetables. So that's the way now, when your mother used to tell you to take your vegetables, that's the way you do it now. Well, yeah, we, we, this is before electricity, of course, since we didn't have blenders. <laughs> ah, excellent. Well, it, overall, I think it's no surprise that your mood and happiness reflect what you eat. As has been said many times, you are what you eat. It's been shown that a Mediterranean-type diet will make you happier. Other diets will make you happier as well, and you have to pick what works for you. Uh, dark chocolate's one of my favorites. It has methylxanthines, brightens up your day. It also has valuable antioxidants. So here it is. It's a great tasting food, and it's healthy for you. And also, don't forget about blueberries. Blueberries every morning. Ginger, my standard poodle, would not be the same without a blueberries in the morning. So remember, the wrong food will let you down and ruin your mood. So pick your meals and snacks carefully. I'm Dr. Paul Carniol. Thank you for joining us today. See you soon. Thank you.